Welcome to Simcha, a celebration of life. I'm your host, Eitan Berger. In our last episode of Stories from Musenberg, Hedy Davis tells us the story of the downfall of this once beautiful little shtetl by the sea and how over the past few years it is slowly making its way back to life. The first pavilion was a wooden pavilion. It, it looks very romantic and very delightful in the photographs that one sees, very charming, but it really couldn't accommodate more than about a couple of hundred people at a time having tea, a couple of hundred people at a time having uh, changing their clothes. And so it was decided to build the great concrete pavilion that stood until 1968, 69. Um, it was very much loved in its time. But the unfortunate thing was it was built on pillars and the pillars were reinforced with steel. By 1959, 1960, chunks of concrete were fla flaking off these pillars, the water having washed underneath this place for 20, 30 years. And eventually a decision was taken, a unilateral decision was taken to demolish the building and build a new pavilion. What they didn't realize was that it was going to take twice as long to demolish this concrete structure than they ever thought. And so that summer there was nothing but hammering and banging going on. It was the summer of 69. And the Musenburgers, once it was gone, decided that was the end of Musenburg. Suddenly the, the place was not the same. Although, by 1965, it was so musty and smelly inside. I mean, it really had lost its glory. Although, in the early days, it was a wonderful place. Vic Davis had his concerts every Sunday night there. Admission was free, but seats were two shillings and sixpence. In the first place, one shilling, and that was to get around the Sunday Observance Act. Not that it mattered in a place like Musenberg. Can you imagine coming to Musenburg for the summer and having a beautiful cottage like this for three months when it was time to go back to school? You just went on to the train and you went down to Cape Town and your father did his business in Cape Town and Mama stayed here gossiping with all the neighbours. Many would come down by train, two nights or one night depending on which train. The people from Rhodesia's came with four nights or five nights on the train. And then there were the people who came from the Congo, even longer, six, seven nights. They could travel a week to get to Musenberg. But those people came for long holidays. They didn't just come for three weeks. And the train line was so convenient. And they'd get off at the station and they'd say, De Luft, De Luft. The, the air was so wonderful. It was so invigorating. That's what they came for. And that was why Rhodes actually wanted to live in, in Musenberg. He honestly believed that the ozone coming off the sea was good for everybody's health. Meanwhile, in Musenberg, they had a dozen doctors and at least six pharmacies. And that I've never reconciled. That all these doctors and all these pharmacies made such a good living from these healthy people. Sixty-one, sixty-two was when people started to leave Musenberg. And that is the beginning of the, the, of the end as far as Musenberg's concerned. 1976, the trouble of, with the Suito, that was the nail in the coffin for Musenberg. More and more people left Musenberg. And the houses that were vacated were, were sometimes not even let. They were just boarded up. And then people didn't even know who owned that building. And the rates and taxes accumulated. The municipality didn't collect rates and taxes there. The place was falling into disrepute. The, the people who came from other countries found a lovely place to settle. Poor, poor people, and they made a, a good life for themselves there. The Nigerian drug lords settled in Musenberg. It was a very bad time, 1980 to 90. There were several murders. There were several very bad crimes. And so that was when Musenberg's reputation went straight downhill. We're walking along Kilani and we're coming to the little wooden house where Amy Schneider lived. She had a fish shop around the corner and on Sundays she would sell bagels that she baked at her home, bagels and bulka. 
and the rumor was that she had money. And the rumor was that she had so much money that she had a bag of gold hidden in her wardrobe. And unfortunately, what men do, they murder for money. And she, tiny little woman, met her life that way. That was the first murder that actually hit the community. It was just after Sharpeville. It was at a time when South Africa was in turmoil and people were leaving South Africa anyway. And there were so many Jews in Musenberg who thought maybe they should move somewhere safer. So that was the beginning of, of really the whole change of the, of the place. Then instead of Jews were coming to Musenberg, Jews were now starting to leave Musenberg. Today, Musenberg is once again full of life. Buildings are being restored to their former glory or modernized, and young families and artists are reviving this once thriving, sleepy village by the sea. Musenberg is a different place today. It may not be the Musenberg of our memories, but it's a wonderful, joyous place with young people swarming the, the, the foreshore with their boards and the little coffee shops. And they're, they're, they're beautiful. They're young and they, they're gorgeous and they're enjoying the sea. And it's the most fascinating thing to me to see how Musenberg has been revived. Every cottage in that little area that we call the Kugelgas is renewed. It's beautifully painted. The Victorian fences are repaired. Dahlias grow brightly shining, and the, the play, whole place glows with a different kind of atmosphere. Some people say they can never go back there because it's not the same. Well, the whole world has changed. What do they expect? That it would stay another, another little Yiddish shtetl for another 50 years was never going to happen. Once the community had left Musenberg, was doomed. And it is a different Musenberg today. Labia House has been turned into the most beautiful little museum, beautiful little place to have a, a meal. There are lots of things about Musenberg that are different. The houses, though, are still the same, and the kind of people who live there are still the same. The kind of people who live in Musenberg are people from humble beginnings. They're humble houses, humble cottages, and so you have people living cheek by child and they know their neighbours and if you walk in those little lanes you won't see burglar proofing. You won't see that the doors are locked because people feel safe in that environment. That's how it was in the 40s when those little war widows came to Musenberg with their children. It was very cheap to live there and they were surrounded by Agena, by people who could protect them. And that's the beauty of this little village. It's still the most easy point to get to the sea from any part of Cape Town. Hop on the train and you're in Musenberg and there you are, you're on the beach. You literally fall out of the train onto the beach. And that, that has maintained the popularity of the swimming in Musenberg. Shark scares are far and few between. They do have shark spotters sitting up on boys' drive watching and I feel very safe to go in the sea there. It's, it's still a beautiful place. And I love it because I've always loved it. I've never once for a moment felt threatened when I walked in the streets. There were druggies in the streets. There were drunk clubs in the streets. Cape Town has its burgies. The burgies live in the streets. The one with his dog, the one has a shop set up on the pavement. He goes and rummages and dustbins, finds bits and pieces, puts them there on the fence next to where his, his little spot is there under the bridge. And that's, that's his business. And they're so hysterically funny to talk to. It has a lovely library. It has one pharmacy left of all the pharmacies. It has one little building where the doctors are centered. A dentist, not like in the olden days, half a dozen. One serves the community. It's so charming, you can walk down Palmer Street, nothing's changed. The people may not be Jewish, 
but they're there. The shoemaker, the little grocery store, the little fruit shop, the little coffee shop, and the smells come from the houses. They're not Simmers and they're not Kugel, but they, they, they're delicious food smells. And there are a lot of people who live in Musenberg who are inspired. There are artists, there are poets, there are writers, there are people doing different meditation groups. That's all very interesting. I mean, if I lived in Musenberg, I think I'd love it more than just going there for a few weeks in holiday. I don't really get the full benefit of it. And it has no good hotel. I think that's tragic. It has a couple of boarding houses that are quite charming, some nicer than others. But it, it, hasn't, it hasn't lifted its stature. And it hasn't thrived the way, economically, the way Cork Bay has. It's a sleepy little village. And we love it. I think we love it because it's so sleepy. One of the pleasures of Shabbat is to prepare special dishes that enhance the Shabbat experience. In the days of the Talmud, one of the foods that was considered delightful and used for this purpose was fish. Today, Rebbitson Debbie Sweezer shows us how to prepare and cook a Moroccan-style fish dish. Hi, today I will be making fish. Fish is a typical dish that Jewish families eat on the Sabbath. Depending from where you come from and what culture you follow in the Jewish tradition, you will have different fish dishes. Today I'm going to be making a Moroccan fish, which is very typical for Middle Eastern families to eat on the Sabbath. Also depending where you come from in Morocco depends on the fish that you'll be making. If you come from Spanish Morocco, then the fish dish will resemble the dish that I'm going to be making today, which is a more spicy dish. If you come from French Morocco, then you will have a dish that has a sweeter element to it. So the reason why we eat fish on Shabbat is the Talmud, which is a book which consists of discussions, debates, conversations, um, commentaries on Jewish law that the rabbis have put together over the years, mentions that on Shabbat, which is a, the holiest day on the, in the Jewish calendar, that we should eat something that is very, very special. During the time of the Talmud, fish was a very, very special dish to eat. Included in that is also meat and wine. There's a beautiful story that is mentioned in the Talmud about a man by the name of Yosef. And Yosef was not a very wealthy man, but he ensured that every single week he bought the best of everything for Shabbat. And so one day he went to the market to buy some fish for Shabbat. Also living in this village was a very, very wealthy man. And some fortune tellers had told the wealthy man that Yosef, the poor man in the village, was going to accumulate all of his money and all of his wealth and his possessions. So the wealthy man was very, very afraid of this. So he decided to take all his possessions and sell them. And he sold them and with the money that he received, he bought a beautiful, beautiful precious stone. But still he was scared that Yosef would acquire the stone. So he put the stone underneath his hat on his head in order to ensure that it would be with him all the time. And what happens? He goes out to the market and a huge wind comes along and blows the hat off his head. What happens is that the stone, the precious stone, is carried in the wind to the sea and is swallowed up by a fish. Off Yosef goes to the market to buy his fish and the fisherman comes to him with this beautiful, big, fat, rich, beautiful looking fish, the best of all the fish, and offers it to Yosef for Shabbat, knowing that Yosef always buys the best of the best. So Yosef purchases this fish. He goes home, he cleans the fish, he cuts open the fish to gut it, and what does he find inside? the beautiful precious stone that this man had acquired. And what is the moral of the story? The moral of the story is, is if, if you're going to buy the best for Shabbat and ensure that everything that you have for Shabbat is the absolute best of the best, then Hashem will in fact reward you. So I'm gonna get started with this Moroccan fish dish that I'm going to make, which is also known as kharif fish, which is chili fish. So the ingredients that we're going to use are garlic, coriander, salt, chilies. My chilies have been dried, but you can also use fresh chilies. Paprika, cumin, fresh coriander, 
and fish. And the fish that I'm using is angel fish. It is best to use a fish that is very, very firm and that will not fall apart in the cooking. So, dependent on your taste is how much garlic and chili you're going to eat. Some people actually cut the chili completely open and take the seeds out inside. We don't do this in our family because we all love hot chili. So what we do is we just take the chili and we slice it down the middle so that it actually will open up in the cooking and therefore the seeds will be used. The beauty about this recipe is that it's very, very quick and easy. Literally all the ingredients go into one pot and cook and simmer for a very, very short time. This dish can also be served either hot or it can be served at room temperature. Fish has always served as a major ingredient in Jewish cooking, since they were in ample supply, easy to cook, and believed to represent prosperity and fertility. We rejoin Debbie Sweezer as she continues with one of her favorite Shabbat delights. The first thing that we're going to start doing is we're going to pour the oil into the pan. The best way to do this is to actually ensure that the whole bottom of the pan is covered with oil. Okay, the oil becomes to get hot very, very quickly. So first we're going to put two tablespoons of coriander. Then we will put in our two tablespoons of cumin. Then we add paprika. Normally two to three tablespoons of paprika is absolutely fine. It's best not to use smoked paprika. And then we use salt. When it comes to salt, you have to actually use salt to taste. Normally about two teaspoons is absolutely fine, but you can always add later on. We then just mix the ingredients together in the oil. and it's a pity you can't smell the spices through the camera. These spices are very rich Mediterranean spices. After that, we will add our chilies. Again, it is to taste, depending on how many chilies that you can tolerate. And then we put in our garlic. Now the garlic we've actually chopped up very big. What happens is that when it's busy cooking in the oil, it actually becomes very, very soft. And it's better to use bigger chunks of garlic because if you use smaller chunks of garlic, it can become quite bitter. Again, garlic is to taste. You just allow this to infuse for a little bit in the oil, the garlic and the chili a bit into the oil. What's very interesting as well about why we eat fish on Shabbat is that if you take the gematria, which is the numerical value of every single letter in the Hebrew alphabet, dag is equal to four and gimel is equal to three. And that makes up to seven, which is that Shabbat is on the seventh day. Once this has infused, you can add your fish fillets. You just need to watch that the oil doesn't um, splash over so you can turn it down a bit. It doesn't matter if you place the fish on top of each other. Okay, the smells are absolutely phenomenal. You then take a jug of water. Cold water from the tap is absolutely fine. And you pour it in so that it covers the majority of the fish. Just to mix it around so that you ensure that all the fish is being covered and that the spices and the chili and garlic is all the way through the oil and the fish in the pan. You then take some fresh coriander, which has been washed and checked, and you put it over the fish. 
You then wait for the oil to start to simmer again, which doesn't take a very long time. And once it comes to the boil, you then turn the fish down to simmer and you leave it like that without a cover on it so that you just want the water to reduce and then you are left with a beautiful sauce for your fish. After about 20 to 25 minutes, you should see that most of the water has disappeared and it is now time to plate our fish. So you take a slotted spoon and you just put the fish onto a serving dish. It's best to take a dish that is actually big enough to hold all your fillets because when you're serving it you don't really want to put them on top of one another. Once all the fish is on the plate, you can now take a spoon that is not slotted and you can take the, the good bits of the coriander, the garlic and the chili and just spoon it over the fish. Okay, you just finish off the dish with a sprinkle of fresh coriander. And it's ready to be served. Today's teachings from the Mishnah or Oral Law, contained within Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of Our Fathers, comes from chapter 2, verse 16, where Rabbi Tarfon uses the word employer as a metaphor for God. He would say, It is not incumbent upon you to finish the task. But neither are you free to absolve yourself from it. If you have learned much Torah, you will be greatly rewarded. And your employer in other words, God, is trustworthy to pay you the reward of your labors. And know that the reward of the righteous is in the world to come. We've come to the end of this week's episode of Simcha. Thank you so much for joining us. We love to hear from you. So if you'd like to be in touch with us, please find us on Facebook at Spirit Sister Productions and drop us a line. From myself, Eitan Berger, and the whole team here at Simcha, have a great week and goodbye.